I'm Russ Altman, and today on The Future of Everything, Professor Philip Wong tells us that the pandemic actually accelerated the digital transformation of our society. Things that we were expecting to eventually become digital, Zoom meetings, doctor's visits, all kinds of stuff, actually were accelerated during the pandemic and now are digital. Well, the bad news is our ability to produce chips and create new chips that are more powerful is nowhere near ready. We made this digital transition literally 10 years before all the experts expected it. So now he'll tell us what we need to do to mobilize and create the chips that are needed for the new world. It's the future of computer chips. Computer chips are everywhere and they power all the devices that we use every day, pretty much from refrigerators to the internet. The pandemic has accelerated our use of chips in a predictable way. Zoom, the internet, cameras, speakers, microphones, appliances, they all use the chips and they all are now needing new chips. And our ability to create those chips is simply not there. Not only that, even if we could scale up the manufacturing of these chips, we don't have technologies for the next generation of chips that are faster and more capable and more energy efficient. So there's one of the problems. Another problem is that young engineers and scientists are not going into the field of chip design and fabrication. And so there's a workforce issue. This must be addressed very quickly because if we want to have the increasing power that we have grown used to, we need to have people designing and building these chips. Professor Philip Wong is a professor of electrical engineering at Stanford University. He is an expert at the design and fabrication of computer chips, and he works on developing new ways to build faster, more capable, and more energy efficient chips. Philip will begin by telling us that a semiconductor is a special material that can sometimes allow electricity to flow, and sometimes it can block the flow. It's used to create tiny switches or transistors that are either on or off. With thousands, millions, or billions of these switches, we can build chips that then can control devices, communication, uh, and a myriad other things. First of all, what is semiconductor? That's a really good question. A semiconductor is something as you can de decouple the words, right? Semi and conductor, right? Conductor is something that conducts electricity, right? Semiconductor is kind of conducts electricity. And so if we ask, well, why do I want something that's kind of conduct electricity and not completely conduct electricity? Yes. It's because we want to be able to control the flow of electricity through a material. This is a semiconductor, it's a material. So by, by controlling the flow of electricity, we can basically, it looks like, you can take an analogy about turning on and off a faucet or a garden hose, right? So you can turn on and off the flow of electricity, just like flipping a light switch, right? So now a computer or anything that you're computing is just composed of a bunch of switches, very tiny switches, nanometer scale switches, and that makes up a computer. So semiconductor is the material that you can turn on and off at will, well, by applying electric field voltages and so on, and to, to basically more just like flipping a light switch, a really nanometer scale light switches. And so is it fair to say that when we talk about computer chips, it's a, it's a little chip, it's, it really is a chip, and it is just an array of millions or billions of on-off switches? Absolutely, a billions of on-off switches, and of course there are other things that are, that are also useful too, like capacitors, what is capacitors, things that store electricity. Right. Uh, just like, you know, guy, you have a garden hose, you have a water tank, you need right. a water tank. Right? Okay. So, so now I, I know that, you know, chips came on the scene in the 50s, 60s, and they're just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, and now a lot of us have been hearing about a crisis. We, some people can't buy cars, for example, these days, because they're having, they, they're, <laughs> at least what, they, cars. right, exactly. What their dealer tells them is that they're having trouble getting the chips. So what is the nature and is this a fundamental problem or is this just the pandemic and a lot of stuff and it's, and everything will be fine? No, I think uh, uh, that it's a, it's a combination of both, right? So chips 
are doing all this computation. They they are using all kinds of electronics products from your cell phones, your computers, to your refrigerators, cars that things that help you roll up the windows or start your car or control your your steering or, or self driving and things yes. like that. So everything that you are familiar with that requires computation, controls, all running on chips, all kinds of chips, different kinds of chips, not just computer chips, right? And so now this has been, this ubiquitous chips has been infused in our daily lives already, right? And we don't even know it. We, right. We're using chips without even knowing it, right? So but you and I on this call, we're using tons of chips. Exactly. We have cameras, the chips in the camera, the chips in the computer, the chips in, that helps you communicate with each other through the internet. So the chips everywhere. So right. more and more looking forward, even now and looking forward, more and more of our lives are being basically run by chips, right? And now, okay, so you may ask why now, right? Right, right. <laughs> and why now is the, with the pandemic that came, the pandemic basically accelerated the digital transformation society, accelerated by at least like 10 years. Uh, just oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Well, well, we used to say, okay, well, we have online teaching, well, we went to university, right? We yes, you're right. Maybe so I did on. realize it. Maybe I did realize it. Right, that, that's great, right? But that didn't happen until the pandemic came and everybody is doing online teaching, right? Yes, and in medicine, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm now seeing patients and I'm seeing my own doctors. Uh, first, we're doing it online before I ever show up to the clinic. Absolutely, yeah, I'm seeing my doctor and they say, I'm not going to see you until you, you have a video call. Right. <laughs> Right okay. now, if it goes by the normal pace of events, this will happen in maybe ten years, twenty years, uh, right? Um, maybe, maybe in our lifetime, maybe not even happen in our lifetime, right? But now it happens like zoop, overnight. Okay. So all of a sudden, all of these activities that we do, the digital transformation that we need to have, will, that relies on chips, all of a sudden becomes. Well, essential, uh, and also not only essential, but multiply zillion times, basically. Okay. So that's why there's a shortage of these semiconductors. Now, do I see relief going forward? I would say no. Not only we don't, we won't see a relief. We will see accelerated. The okay, so we were we were not ready. We're we're not ready for this explosion in the demand for chips. We were not ready for the accelerated pace of digital transformation, okay. Okay. which will, which is already happening, right. but now it's accelerated. Right. Now, so we might have thought we, we, we might have thought we had ten years, and then boom, we don't have ten years. Okay, got exactly. it, got it, got it. Exactly. And now going forward, I would say the demand is going to be even higher because we have seen with very within a very short amount of time, we have seen the benefits of this digital transformation. And now, you, once you've seen the benefits, you want more. Yeah, yes, okay. So um, then the question that comes up is, is this just a question of gearing up fabrication faculty, uh, facilities so that they can make more chips like they made yesterday, or is that not the solution? In other words, are, is our current chip technology enough to meet demand and just it's a question of scaling up the uh, production? Or is there a more fundamental question that even if we could scale up, the chips today are not the chips we need tomorrow and, and the next year? Excellent question, right? A lot of people compare chips with like oil, like fossil fuel, right? Right. And, and so fossil fuel is essential to run a society, chips are essential to run a society, so chips is like oil. No, this okay. chips is not oil. It's not totally different from oil. Oil is in the ground, it's there for millions of years. Right. It will be there. If right. you take it up today versus you take it up a million years later, it's the same oil. It's a fixed commodity. It's a fixed thing. It yeah. never changes. Right. But and oil won't oh, probably won't go bad. <laughs> <Get more oil. laughs> but chess is a constantly changing things. You are not going to be running your apps today with a cell phone that was 20 years ago. Right. In fact, 20 years ago, you couldn't run an app. <laughs> so chess, in order to show its value to society, 
has to constantly renew and develop new technologies. Right. Every year, every other year, there's a new product coming out, uh, the new phone, new computer, new what, new gadget, whatnot, and uh, higher levels of self-driving car capability. Every year, in order to show, in order to realize the benefits of chips, it has to constantly renew. So therefore, building up manufacturing capability is one part of the equation. The other very important part of the equation is continue to do the R&D to develop new generations of technologies. Because without the new generation, everything is static, nothing's going to happen. The computer science people cannot write programs using chips of 20 years ago. Right, gotcha. Okay, so that's a perfect introduction because I did want to get into a little bit of the technical stuff because it's so exciting. And then we can pop up and talk about the role of government a little bit later. But I, I looked at all your papers and one of the things you talk about a lot is the move from 2D to 3D. So yeah. what, what does that mean? Oh, what does that mean? Okay, today's chips are two dimensions. Let me give you. Sorry. Like they're flat. They're like crackers. So here's a wafer that is. Well, oh, look at this. Wafer. Well, for those of look you who are this. on radio, uh, Philip is showing me a big disc, a big disc, flat disc. It looks like an old time record, like a, a vinyl record. It's a 12 inch pizza. Okay. Right, 12 inch pizza. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so these things, uh, uh, we have the, in a typical chip, for example, in a processor chip. Uh, you have like 10 billion transistors in there, or you know, multiple tens of billions of transistors in there. And those are all laid out in, in a two-dimensional plane, just like Los Angeles. Okay, 2D. Okay. And now, uh, the way that over the past maybe 40, 50 years, the way to have more transistors built on the chain chip, because the more more switches you have, the more things you can do, right? Right, right. And so to, to do that is to shrink the individual chips, the individual switches, those, like thinking about Los Angeles, right? Instead of, uh, you, you want to build more houses, okay, you shrink the size of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and, and people are doing that. They have the tiny house movement. Exactly, the tiny house movement. But that's not going to be the solution. Right. <laughs> we shrink it, and at, at, at some point, you, you don't want to shrink it anymore. It's so small, and today it is so small that you really could not really shrink them anymore. What do you do? Go from Los Angeles to Manhattan. Right. That's the whole simple idea. Okay, so we're, we're going to build chips that are, look more like, instead of looking like a pizza, they might look like a block, or, or they'll, they'll, have, yeah. they'll have depth to yeah. them. Uh, and, they and, have depth, and, and we already have those chips. Okay. Uh, you have them in your phone. Or, oh, really? So this is not the yes. future. This is it now. No, no, no. It's, the future is here. <laughs> okay. So another thing, I, I'm just going to jump from topic to topic because this is so fun. Um, another thing that I know you work on is carbon uh, nanotubes. Yeah. So, uh, why are those important for chips? And what okay. are they? What are they? Well, uh oh, he's gonna he's uh -oh, getting more props. Yeah. The, the, okay, so <laughs> so for those of you listening, here's a, a, a okay. model of a carbon nanotube. It's a, uh, this is a model, of course. Uh, the, the actual tube is about a, a nanometer uh, in diameter. Okay. And just for those of you who are listening, we're looking at a like a molecular model with a bunch of atoms linked together in a mesh. It looks like a chicken chicken wire. Is imagine chicken wire. That's what it looks right. like. Okay, so uh, the carbon nanotube, why is it interesting, right? Yes. Uh, the, I, I mentioned this uh, switches, uh, semiconductors, right? Which is like a switch you can turn on and off. The carbon nanotube can flow electricity very efficiently, very fast. Okay. Okay. So that makes the switches go very fast. The computers can go very fast. So it's like uh, almost like a, a replacement for copper wire? Uh, no, copper wire is a conductor. It always conducts. Okay. This one can conduct or not conduct ah, based on what you want. I see. Okay, okay. and so, so this is so going to be... one aspect. The other aspect that's important is that it's related to the 3D chips that you just mentioned, right? Uh, today, we make chips out of silicon. And in order to make your chips out of silicon, you need to heat things up to more than 1,000 degrees centigrade, really high, okay? But then the wires are made out of copper and other... Uh, insulators that could not take those high temperature. Uh, so what we do now is to first make the switches and then build the wires that connect the switches later. Uh, okay, because the high temperature process starts first and then you go to lower temperature and that doesn't mess up anything, right? 
So now that means that you can only build one layer. Right? Because now if you want to build more layer, you need to go to high temperature again. And, but you've already put the copper down and you have a problem. Yeah, you got a problem, right? But with the carbon nanotubes, you could build the switches at low temperatures. Ah. At the temperature that does not require, that will that will allow the copper wires and other wires to survive. So you can build multiple layers of these things. So this is an enabler to build 3D chips. Gotcha. Not only because, uh, the two things, one is it goes very fast, two is an enabler to do 3D chips. Okay, so so those were two great technologies. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is um, energy efficiency. Everybody's worried about energy. Yep. You were talking about oil before. Um, yep. How are our chips doing in terms of their efficiency? And is there any move, to, is, it, is it a thing to worry about the efficiency of these chips or have they reached their maximum efficiency? Where are we in energy use? Oh, energy efficiency is a, a, gating, fa is a gating factor for everything that we do in in chips, uh, in terms of design, in terms of fabrication, every, energy efficiency is the only thing, not the only thing, the most important thing to gauge the advancement of technology okay, from good. one generation to any, another generation. So there's a very important question that you ask. And so to improve the energy efficiency of computing is the most important thing to do for this community. Okay, and how are we doing? Is all of, are these three D chips with the nanotubes? Are they naturally going to be more efficient, or are they not so great with efficiency issues? Oh yeah, they are going to be naturally more efficient because much of the energy that we burn up today in our system is because we need to shuffle the data from the memory chip to the computing chip or you shuffle the data back and forth. You need data to compute, and after right. you compute, you need to put the data back, right? Right, right. That wastes a lot of time and a lot of energy moving things around, right? Now, in, if you can do 3D chips, you can put memory on top of the logic so that you could, the memory can be much closer in physical distances, yes. and you get yes. more connections in parallel instead of doing it serially. Yep. So doing it serially burns a lot of uh, energy power, but doing it in parallel would allow you to be more energy efficient. So the shorter so paths, the shorter paths help. To better energy efficiency. Okay, great, great. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Professor Philip Wong next on Sirius XM Business Radio Channel 132. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Philip Wong of Stanford University. In the last segment, we discussed the importance of computer chips, the ways in which they are improving, and the need for more of them. In this next segment, Philip will tell us about what is needed globally to increase the supply of chips. He'll tell us that it must involve government, industry, even academia, and it has to be cooperative. The U.S. is considering a new bill. It's called the CHIPS Act, which will help to enhance and get us started in this new wave of innovation for chips. Unfortunately, there are political and other barriers to global cooperation that have to be addressed if this is going to be successful. As I mentioned before, chips are not oil, so they have to constantly evolve and get better and better, more energy efficient, right? So more R&D is, need is needed. And if you look at the kind of mind share of academia and also even in society, the mind share is not there right now. Uh, the mind share is, well, let's do AI, let's do build a few more apps, let's uh, do quantum computing, that right. kind of thing. Right. The mind share is not there. So I think what we need to do as a community is to build that mind share. So you say, mean literally young people, young people are not going into this field at uh, sufficient numbers? Yes, young people are not going into this field because they did not realize that this is the enabler for everything that we do. I see. Is it an enabler for the AI that we want? Is it an enabler for the self-driving cars that we want? Is it an enabler for all the digital transformation that we want? Is it an enabler for combating climate change? For example, to combat climate change, you need to first collect the data. How do, what do you do to collect the data? Zillions of sensors around yes. the world and a network of that, of the, uh, that collects those data and, co and, and analyze those computers to analyze those things. Without, if, if you only use today's computers and today's sensors, 
to do that job, it will never solve the problem. Okay. So, so when you say mind share, we it is literally the attention of uh, of, of of young emerging scientists and engineers who are they're thinking about AI, they're thinking about all these other fields that you mentioned, and then they're not being drawn to these fundamental components of our digital infrastructure. Exactly. You know, we, when, when students come through the campus, right, they all want to say what I would call save the world, right? right. <laughs> make an impact to the world. How do you make an impact to the world? Solve this fundamental foundational technology make this foundational technology better so that we can all go out and save the world. So is this a national challenge? And I'm wondering, do we have to worry about competing? Like, is this something that is a strategic interest of the United States? Or is that the wrong way to think about it? And it's really a global cooperation problem. Excellent point. I think this is a global thing that the, the world needs to come together and solve this. It's not one country or one region it you know, globe societal challenges are global climate change is global energy sufficiency is global everything that we COVID, do COVID, a lot of things COVID global. was global COVID is global right? yeah. you cannot just self-contain yourself and say, I'm good right? okay and, and and okay so what does the world need to do I, I know that you've written about this and you, you you think that it's possible to come up with a very good plan to uh, to approach these problems yeah first of all we need to think globally and not just solve things locally and uh, even supply chain problem or building fabs of uh, manufacturing plants somewhere or doing R&D we ought to think globally and say Let's say, take a something that you and I know really well, doing research and development, doing research, right? Research is global. We need to foster international collaboration. Bright, bright minds showed up everywhere in the world. We need to be able to collaborate and get good ideas flowing around. Uh, we need to build infrastructure. Nations and regions, uh, regions meaning Europe and North America, Asia and so on, and nations, right? needs to build infrastructure to allow to lower the energy barrier for researchers to experiment with new ideas. Uh, today, take an example. If I want to build a, if I come up with a new idea for a new transistor or whatever, a new switch, it would be almost impossible to, to test it out at scale. I can test it out in the laboratory in here. I can build one transistor, two transistors, maybe even a hundred, a thousand. If I can build a thousand, I'm already a hero. Right. right. I can go to a conference and some of my chest is, hey, I built a thousand transistors, right, in the laboratory. But a, a real chip has a billion transistors right. with right. several orders of magnitude off. How do you convince the company to invest in the development to use this new technology? So this is big, what I call lab to fab translation gap. Oh, I How like that. I like that. that lab to fab because fab yeah. is the fabrication at the at scale. That's right. Fab is a manufacturing plant. That's the, the, the kind of tech jargon for a like semiconductor it. manufacturing like plant. So lab to fab translation. Well, we have invented something in a lab in the university laboratory or small company or even big company right. have labs, right? Like Bell Labs, right? And how do you translate that into something that is manufacturable? Okay. And that is a huge gap right now. So I'm sure that there's a big question, and I'm sure you've thought about this. Who needs to pay for this? Is this the government's responsibility, or should the private sector build those facilities because they're the ones who are ultimately going to uh, benefit? Or is it academia, although I don't see how academia can do big projects like this without help from either government or industry. So how do you pay for this? I think it's all of the above, right? Uh, for the government certainly could help uh, with, uh, with big bucks. Uh, industry should not just sit back and say, oh, give me the money and do this, because eventually it's the, it's the shareholder who benefits from it, and they should be a partner in that. University, of course, could not really put chip in money other than you know very wealthy right. <laughs> universities like Harvard, who has 100 million to spend, right? <laughs> right. So university couldn't chip in the the, 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 the the money, but the university can chip in what? And chip in faculty hires. Yes. Faculty hiring in the right fields, in the fields of science and engineering, hardware, material science, chemistry, physics, electrical engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, all those fields that are related to uh, advancing semiconductor technology. So universities have a really strong role to play. 
because university lead in the intellectual direction. Yes. So, so tell me this, how is it looking? Like, have government leaders identified this problem? It, are they taking steps to kind of create this ecosystem that you feel is missing but necessary for the next generation of chip? Or do, or do we have to write letters to our Congress people in order to encourage them to understand the, the, the magnitude of this challenge? Well, there is a, uh, there are the, a bill on, on, on the floor in Congress, uh, the, the generally they call the CHIPS Act. And, CHIPS Act, okay, nice yes, and straightforward. The, pre the president is pushing for it, and the president actually mentioned it in the State of the Union address, and other countries and regions like Europe has the corresponding CHIPS Act, and Japan government has invested on things, so various countries and regions are recognized, have recognized its problems. Um, the challenge of twofold, one, at least in the U.S., the challenge is this gridlock in Congress, which we need to break. Right. Uh, number two, even after you have the money, the implementation of it is very important. How do you spend the money wisely? And that's the thing that I think this community, this community meaning the academic community and the industry and, of course, government apps and so on, really needs to come together and talk about how best to spend the money and not just talk about what is my piece of the pie? Right. Because that's a lot of discussion right now from companies, unfortunately, to talk about, just say, well, where's my piece of the pie? And now it's not to talk about the, the, where's my piece of the pie. Now's the time to talk about what's best for the industry, for the whole world. And uh, when you look at the CHIPS Act uh, as it's written currently, uh, does it give you optimism that uh, with success will be, does it have all the elements you feel are necessary or are there still things missing that still need to be done to make it a complete package? Well, the legislation is a very broad statement, right? And uh, oh, here is oh, whatever number of billion dollars to do this, right? Okay. Those are great. Those right. are wonderful. Those are, uh, those are the things that right thing to do. But then... Some couple of billion dollars to do X, that X, the devil is in the detail. Right, it's right? about exec execution of the... Execution. We really haven't talked about execution yet, and that's very important to have. And, that's um, the right conversation to have right now. And have the structures been set up for international cooperation? One of your early points in our discussion was that this has to be a global cooperation. Is that infrastructure of cooperation existing? Unfortunately, no, uh, because of the nature of the discussion or about supply chain resiliencies, national security and so right, on. Right. Most of the regions are only taking care of themselves and asking what have this thing, whatever funding that they provide do for me or for right. my country or for my region or for Europe, for America and so on. So so very few, very little discussion has been gone on. In fact, there are a lot of talks about putting up walls yeah. Uh, among re countries and regions say, hey, I'm funding this. You're not going to come and get this research funding and you're not going to be part of our research co consortium because you're not your country X. You're not part of my country. Yes. I think that is not good. Right. So that's that's a frontier that is going to have to be addressed. Maybe next time we talk. Thanks to Philip Wong. That was the future of computer chips. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman on Sirius XM Business Radio Channel 132.